Hana Wasalan Shalom Salam from Jerusalem. This is our Middle East. Al Shak Al Asadlana Man. Together, our whole region for all the peoples of the region. Today we're going to talk about from Jeddah to Jerusalem, Saudi Arabia and Israel advancing quiet normalization, not high decibel normalization. There's no better person to talk about these issues in an evolving, emerging, uh, innovative Middle East than Fleur uh, Hassan Nahum, Fleur, Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, a major envoy uh, of uh, the capital of the Jewish state to the entire Middle East. And as a matter of fact, a number of years ago, Fleur, you and I met in Dubai, where you had been many times before my first trip, which is in 2020. And... Uh, Look, look, give us your bird's eye view of where this region has come since you've been deputy mayor for a number of years. You've seen the whole Middle East evolved and, and you uh, have been an envoy of Jerusalem to the rest of the region. Well, it's wonderful to be on your show. Um, and I congratulate uh, you and, and your center for the incredible work that you're doing in that time Thank of you. work in, in building bridges and bringing about new normalization um, it's it's very, very significant. We're looking at a different region. That's the bottom line. You know, when myself and my co-founder, Dorian Barak, three years ago, this time, exactly three years ago, June, which is two months, two and a half months before the announcement of the Abraham Accords, and we kept meeting with Americans from the embassy at the time when uh, David Friedman was ambassador, and we kept feeling that something was happening um, and Dorian, who flies a lot, to, you know, to the Gulf for many, many years, kept saying to me, something's cooking up. And nobody really knew how quickly it was going to happen. And then all of a sudden, you know, in August, we get this announcement that the UAE is willing, are willing to normalize with Israel. And then Bahrain follows and then Morocco follows. Nobody saw it coming so quickly. And I think that we have to look at the process and how it happened um, and look at Saudi almost in the same way um, with this kind of under-the-radar normalization because that's what we're seeing. But I honestly think that our government officials and representatives are talking too much about it because in the Arab world, it's all about the image and it's all about how to do it respectfully. And I think we need to do it at the pace that they're willing to go at it. Um, and it is happening very slowly. From a business perspective, I see it. Bahrain has given Israel an incredible opportunity to build a metaphorical and literal, there is a literal bridge between Bahrain and Saudi. And you see a lot of Israeli companies penetrating Saudi markets through Bahrain. You see that happening through the UAE. You see a lot of Israeli technology playing an important role in building their new city, their new smart city, uh, Neo. And so we're seeing, again, like we saw with the UAE before the Abraham Accords, we're seeing a lot of under-the-radar normalization, and we have to facilitate it and get out of the way in terms of let, let the market do its work. Well, that's a very interesting point, getting out of your own way, yes. as the term goes, in the West. Yes. Tell us, as uh, Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, has Israel had a challenge getting out of its own way in, in this whole, you know, three-year process of uh, what they say in Arabic is tatbiya, this uh, normalization uh, process? Well, listen, it's not been a very stable time in Israeli politics because in, since in, in the Abraham Accords, which was, of course, uh, led and the architect was uh, Netanyahu and, and, and his people then, um, we then had, uh, you know, four failed, uh, failed, uh, four elections that didn't produce a government, a government which was a coalition of very, dis very different parties, and then another election with a new government, and then all these demonstrations. So... In terms of the Gulf states, they're kind of a little confused about what's going on in Israel. As we know, um, Arab leaders very much respect strength 
And what they see is confusing to them in terms of well, what's going on. Who do we talk to? Why isn't the government got a strategy? Why don't we have one person to talk to? Why is why are there 20 ministers dealing with the Abraham Accords? So from their perspective, they are very top-down society. They don't understand why civil society has to be leading this uh, and why there's not one point person in the Israeli government to deal with it. And so, you know, the prime minister uh, has a million other things to deal with. Of course, this is a priority. But again, I think that in um, in, in, in the governments of the Gulf, there's a feeling that... Um, there's no clear strategy as what we want to achieve and where the Abraham Accords are going. Uh, thankfully, that doesn't mean that it's going in a bad direction. It just means that um, they're looking at Israel and, and and they don't really understand uh, what's going on here. That's a very interesting observation, uh, Fleur, because if you look at uh, Mohammed bin Salman, this is a young leader. He's, yeah. he's under 40. Yeah. And he has a clear vision that he has um, laid out, which is called Saudi 2030, yeah. in which he sees Saudi Arabia as the startup nation of the Arab world. Uh, he sees Saudi Arabia as a net exporter of clean energy, of defense systems, of technology, of leading in innovation. And he, in, in, in as I see it, he looks at Israel uh, with quiet appreciation for the innovation, for the uh, startup nation uh, that Israel has become, and uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, it, it seems to me that he sees um, a transactional Israel as opposed to what you just stated is as, as an Israel that is a, a low decibel, quiet partner for normalization together with KSA um, in bringing the region to a, a new place. Well, I, 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 I think he's got a number of challenges that we can't underestimate in terms of moving forward with the normalization as opposed to just a, some quiet under the radar business relationship. His father, who's, you know, elderly and sick, but, you know, was, was seen as one of the defenders of the Palestinian cause. He can't disrespect his father and move forward uh, towards some type of... Uh, normalization, at least an open one uh, at the moment. A, B, which is interesting, you you just heard, you know, the foreign minister, which I've been told is, you know, uh, we have we have to take things with a pinch of salt, but he, they used to talk about an arrangement with the Palestinians, and now they're talking about a process, a pathway um, to peace. So they've already also kind of softened up their rhetoric in terms of what we need in order to move forward with Israel, which I think is actually very interesting. It's a very interesting thing, and this was just last week. Um, I think that people were very worried when they saw the kind of rapprochement between Saudi and Iran brokered by the Chinese. And I think that the Chinese were only brought in. I mean, they didn't need them to broker peace. They brought the Chinese to send a strong message to the United States you want to stay out of the region, we're going to replace you. We have options. We have options, exactly. And we're hedging our bets. And it worked because all of a sudden, after that, what are we seeing in the last few weeks? The, um, the There's talk that the Americans want to try and bring some type of normalization with Israel as part of a regional deal. The Americans all of a sudden have woken up and want to be more involved. Um uh, you know, we, we can think about a year and a half ago when, when Biden went and asked them to increase oil production and they said, no, thank you. And so, you know, you see that it's always moving parts. But whatever they did with the Chinese worked because all of a sudden now we have the United States engaging more with Saudi. They're is... engaging. Here is the challenge, though. You see statements coming out of the United uh, the, this, the Biden administration that seem to place the Palestinian issue as a, some sort of quid pro quo, um, it, it, together with the um, talks of the indications of a revived JCPOA of some variety, and hanging out Saudi-Israeli normalization with American support as part of that, you know, you call it moving pieces, as part of that quid pro quo. Yes, but again, Netanyahu has said very clearly, we're not going to kind of swallow a bad deal with Iran just for the sake of uh, normalization with the Saudis. And the Saudis also don't want Iran to advance its uh, nuclear ambitions. 
And they're talking about a civil nuclear plant, which would create a situation in the region where, where we now have, you know, nuclear arms, nuclear race. arms race. This is really not where we want to be going um, for any price. So it's it's interesting. And now we go into an election year in America, you know, the ambassador here leaving uh, a new position, the Abraham Accords envoy, which is good. It's welcome, Dan Shapiro, who knows a thing or two about that. Uh, he's, he's a good, honest broker, in my opinion. And so, I don't know, things are accelerating. Things are accelerating. But I, I honestly think that we have to kind of, st uh, the, the rhetoric of the, the Israeli government has to kind of, you know, be, be a little sort of calmer. And let, um, you know, I'm a big, like you, I'm a big believer of free markets and letting kind of the business do what it does best. And that is breaking down the barriers because of mutual interests. And we see that happening. And that is very encouraging. We do. And we do see other signs of what we call quiet normalization. The the Saudis have generously opened up their airspace. Yeah. You, you see, they've reached out to the... Oman, you know, is uh, everything that happens in the region, you have to understand has been given a nod okay by Saudi. So if Amar are opening their airspace, that's also part of the Saudi saying, yeah. Yeah, okay. clearly. Interestingly, um, the the Saudis have opened their arms also to Palestinian Arab um, pilgrims, to the Hajj from Judea and Samaria, yeah. as well as, you know, a, an implicit invitation to Arab Israelis uh, to join the Hajj. Uh, they want to do flights. Imagine this. Right. If you have now flights, for whatever reason... From Israel uh, to to Jeddah for the for the Hajj, full of Arab Israelis. That that is progress. We yeah. shouldn't think for a second that it isn't. And imagine for a second if next year we find ourselves in the opposite position and having Saudis come for Ramadan to uh, Haram al Sharif, the Temple Mount. So that's the next question I want to ask you. How, how do you see uh, Jerusalem as playing a more confident role? in this quiet normalization process that is taking place? Look, I've I've been saying for three years that if we really know, knew how to play this correctly, we could have a real surge of Muslim pilgrims to Jerusalem. Why not? Uh, it would make complete sense. Unfortunately, in this country, the biggest problem is that our uh, airports, our immigration authority, is not really set up for a mass uh, of Muslim pilgrims, we haven't figured it out at the airport. I mean, I, I've been shouting about this for three years, and I've been saying the whole time, if we don't learn how to receive hospitably our Arabs at the airport, um, we're not going to be able to say we are benefiting from regional tourism. And and I mean, I've, I've, had, I've sent letters, I've got a meeting coming up now with somebody very high up in the um, immigration authority to talk exactly about the subject. My name is Hassan, okay? Um, I have an official, you know, political position in this country, and I get stopped at the airport constantly. I had a friend who... Well, you're a very dangerous... Uh, yeah, very dangerous. Look at me. So I, <laughs> so I had a friend who traveled with me for the first time. We, she, we, we had a conference and we traveled together, and she's got a very Jewish-Israeli name. And she was in shock by the questions that they were asking me to try and ascertain who I was and what's my background, because they can't ask me directly, you know. Um, I've had a lot of bad uh, experience with guests that we've had, my, my council, my women's forum, to Israel leaving the country, being held back to the point that they lose their flights, the humiliation we, if we really are serious about this, we, the rest of the country, the Shabak, whoever is in charge of this, the borders people, we need to get our act together because otherwise this is going to be very one way. And people keep asking me, so why aren't there tons of Muslim tourists coming from the region? Well, if you had one bad experience in Ben-Gurion, would you come back? Would you tell your friends to come? Of course not. There's another issue going on here besides this very real um, an even palpable problem of misunderstanding Arab culture and having Arabic speaking, I mean, scores of Arabic speaking women and men of fish security officials and immigration officials at our uh, crossing points, at our airports in order to, and as we say, it's our Middle East. It's a larger concept now than 
what Israel had experienced. And don't get me wrong, I understand the paranoia. Believe me, I know that they're protecting me and my children. I don't, for one second, uh, say that this this is not justified. But I think it's time to develop another way. We we have enough information from the different countries. We know who's coming. We we are able. We have a we have a visa upon arrival system with the UA, for example. There should be a way of being able to understand who people are, um, to the point that we don't have to harass them or make them feel uncomfortable at the border. Absolutely, there there there's an additional issue, and and that is that uh, the Palestinian Authority and the, and the Jordanian WAC have have got to start getting it together and joining the circle of, of, of peace. Because what's happened is, if you are a Saudi, or if you are a Bahraini, or you're an Emirati, and you want to pray at Al-Aqsa, you're going to have a really hard time, not from the Israeli security officials, but from the Waqf oh, officials absolutely. who have BDSed, they have boycott, uh, uh, they have boycott divestment and sanctioned their Saudi brother, their Gulf brothers, uh, well, from praying uh, on uh, well, the, the Haram Sharif? If you go there in your regular clothes, then nobody's going to know. But if you go there in your traditional wear, which is what people want to do when they go and pray there, if you look like an Emirati or a Bahraini, you will get abuse because I have actually witnessed uh, walking down with an Emirati friend. We were in a ceremony um, in an opening of something, walking down the street in Jerusalem, not even on Temple Mount, and getting harassed um, by young, uh, you know, East Jerusalemites uh, down the street, literally to the point that we had to call the police. And so nobody is taking any type of responsibility for this. And certainly there is abuse if they know where you're coming from. And that's ridiculous. And I think the Gulf states have to actually talk to Jordan and say, well, what the hell? Well, that's the key issue here. I mean, this is really where in, in what we call soft or quiet, low decibel normalization really has to happen because the, you know, it, the Jordanians are, have to play a more helpful role in this entire regional development. Uh, yeah, the Jordanians are, um, you know, I guess they probably would say that they're between a rock and a hard place because they have a majority Palestinian population there. Um, they themselves are, you know, Hashemites in a place which is not Hashemite. They're the minority. Um, but I think that King Abdullah, you know, goes a little bit too far in, in, in French is an expression, kis excuse, s'excuse. You know, constantly he protests too much just to show that he's not too friendly with Israel, but really needs us. <laughs> we need him, let's be honest. And not wanting to, I mean, just now, uh, I was talking to somebody involved in the Negev summit, they still haven't said they're joining, and it's ridiculous. We've had peace with them for, for, for decades. So two, three decades, uh, two and a half decades, and they still can't say that they're joining the, the, the Negev summit of foreign ministers when you've got all the other countries, including Egypt. What's going on? Well, what's going on, I, I think, is that is that Jordan and, and Egypt is another story, of course, uh, certainly on a governmental level, a relationship uh, with uh, with the general Sisi, President Sisi is is much is much stronger. Yeah. However, the massive anti normalization uh, in Egypt and in Jordan, massive Jew hatred to to the core, is very much driven uh, by Palestinian political hybrid warfare. Yes, and also the fact that even though we made peace with them, their media remained super hostile. Uh, there's key people in these positions, in media and academia and education in these countries that have really not let go um, and have not moved to the new era. Uh, in the Gulf, it's it's very uh, also slow, I mean, in terms of the media coming around. Um, also, uh, when you look at the media in, in the different Gulf states, it's it, apart from sort of media that is English speaking, um, the Arabic speaking media is still not as balanced as we would like them to and be. And you know why? For and and the why, and you do know why. So we because the at a recent trip uh, to the Gulf, a uh, a senior Gulf leader official expressed it to me this way. He said, uh, "Dan, our people need to see the fruits of this normalization relationship. 
the transactionality of it, the uh, fund to fund relationship, the the uh, Middle East Business Council, which you're a leader of, um, is nice and it's important and it's worth billions of dollars in uh, in bilateral and even multilateral uh, trade and commerce. However, semicolon but comma, as I learned in university, the peoples of the region need to feel that the fruits of the relationship are filtering down water security, food security, energy, but that, jobs. But things take time. You know, you're not going to see in two and a half years. I mean, just look at the trade numbers. Are we, we, we're going to be in $3 billion at the end of this year. That's incredible. You know how much we have with... That's with the UAE. With the UAE. Yeah. And you know how much we have with... The, just to compare, the UK, we have a 5 to $7 billion relationship with them. We've always had <laughs> trade with them. And look, how fast uh, the UA has become, you know, one of the top uh, trading partners of Israel. So the future in terms of business looks bright. The trickling down of the benefits of energy, et cetera, that's a whole other story. It will take time. Um, but I think fundamentally the dissonance here is what I, where I find the dissonance is that, um, that these societies are very top down. And our society is very bottom up. You know that. That's a good point. In this country, we, you know, you you somebody said said to me, in this country, you go when you go to the government if you want a good idea to die, <laughs> <laughs> but if you actually want an idea to flourish, it's left in the hands, or it's always led by civil society or business, and it's so true. true. That is the spirit of the Saddam nation. You have to tell me why you're my boss. Not the other way around. You know, my right? son is in an, is um, in a uh, elite unit in the army, and he's telling me how much the army uh, officer corps is built from the bottom up. Yeah. In the sense that the lower level officers are pushing the upper level officers and can replace them at any given moment. Absolutely, and it's a very different mentality. That is, to me, that is the core of the dissonance uh, that we have is that their society, everything has to be approved from top down. Uh, they don't really understand civil society, nonprofits. It's not something which is super developed. Um, I mean, again, there's good reason for them to have been a top-down society. Remember, they were very successful, probably the only Arab country that has been successful, the UAE, in kicking out Islamic fundamentalism. They really have been. And the reason for that is because they, 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 their finger is on the pulse at every given moment. But in terms of kind of the relationship and the development of the relationship, um, I've found that that the top down there and the bottom up here has somehow, uh, you know, it's taking time to understand each other's mentality. It doesn't mean that we're not getting there. We are getting there. And that's why the business community is actually the real... Um, Envoy, the, the mediator. Real, the real mediator yeah. here. And it's what you say. They want to see the fruits. The fruits are going to come through business. They're not going to come through another kind of a kumbaya event. Let's talk about Jews and Muslims holding hands. That's all very nice, but that's not what's going to actually move the needle. The needle is going to be moved by the business community doing business and creating regional solutions for regional challenges. Yeah, absolutely. In in, in fact, um, do you see the in this new environment of reform in the Middle East, and uh, Mohammed bin Salman has actually been a key uh, leader in in issuing reform, especially with regard to women. I mean, what's happened in King of Saudi Arabia with regard to the status of women is no, nothing short of revolutionary in the last few years. Yeah, people don't really understand how to appreciate what a very kind of traditional country this man has inherited, uh, essentially, and how hard it is to move the needle on such a traditional society that was educated for so many years in fundamentalist kind of, uh, you know, uh, culture. Um, to have women driving for like less than five years now, to have more women working, to have more women taking leadership roles, that's revolutionary. Um, you know, we, we could look at it cynically from a kind of liberal purchase from here and say, oh, but look, you know, I was in a, I was in the UK last week and, and there was, um, we had a panel for Yom Atzimot in the in the Israeli embassy, and a journalist uh, from the Guardian and uh, said, "Oh, you know, but Saudi Arabia, you know, human rights violations, and look what they did to Khashoggi, um, you know, like uh, downplaying the evolution that is going through." And I said, "Look, 
I thought to myself, if you're going to get up on your high liberal perch, then we can never make peace with the Palestinians because they routinely are killing journalists, they routinely are killing opposition leaders and LGBTQ people throwing them from the rooftop. So, you know, let's not be on a high liberal perch. Let's take the context of the country and really look at them in their own context and see how far they've come. And I really do think that MBS is a young, modern leader who has a real vision. And we have to kind of find a way to, to, to find those uh, entry points. So it's very it's very interesting, your, your point about finding those entry points. We've got to find mental ent entry points. We've got to find physical, concrete entry points. When we look at uh, a couple of weeks ago at uh, uh, the Arab League meeting in Jeddah, the West and, and Israel, for sure, it, it really raised an eyebrow. They said, well, wait a second. Syria has now, for the first time in 12 years, been reinvited. What the devil is going on? But if you look at it from their, from the point of view of MBS and the Saudis, here's a man who's really trying to reinvent the Middle East as its true leader. And, and therefore, you, he's got to uh, show some sense of unity in the Arab League, which has been so fractured before. And it, and it probably is in his interest to, to try to drive Syria away from what we call the Iranian uh, Islamist crescent. 100%. That's the story here. The story is, you know, I mean, Saudi, just because Saudi and, and, and Iran have kind of done some type of normalization doesn't mean they love each other now or they have the common interests. In the the opposite. It, this is kind of a detente for Yemen. It's a hoodna. Yeah, it's, it's a hoodna for Yemen. You know, they, they, they want to stop them arming them. And you know, that's what it's about. Um, but there's still very much this competition of this Muslim kind of the Shia Sunni thing is still very much alive, and I and I definitely think that the Syria play is one uh, more you know one opposite Iran rather than uh, than anything else that we see, and maybe the you know. You know, as you say, you don't make peace with your friends, you make peace with your enemies. True. We make peace. It's true. In, in, in the Arab, you make peace with your enemies, even when your enemies have, have said that, you know, we're going to destroy you, we're going to. But in, in the Arab world, uh, truthfully, that hasn't yet happened. In other words, where, where Israel is unique in the, in the context of the Palestinian issue is that the Palestinian Authority, uh, under the umbrella of the PLO, continue today to call for the destruction of the Jewish and democratic state. That is intolerable. No prime minister will will put up with it. And the Israeli people, the, you know, the Israeli people, including the Arab Israelis, will not put up with it. And that brings me to the to point I want to ask you as deputy mayor. What it, uh, it seems to me that some of Israel's best envoys must be Arab Israelis, you know, Arabic speaking, uh, 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 Israel, uh, Arabic speaking, non-Jewish Israelis, because we have a lot of Arabic, Arabic speaking Jewish Israelis as well sure. from Arab land, exactly, including your own family. Yeah. Uh, but the, the it seems to me there are many Arab Israelis, whether it's uh, Yosef Haddad or Khaled Abu Tuame and, and others yeah, yeah. who are great yeah. envoys Absolutely. for the state of Israel. Absolutely. Can they become uh, observers in these Arab League meetings? And we've got to sort of integrate uh, ourselves in, into this region as part of sort of this quieter. Uh, low decibel process of normalization. I think that they are fantastic envoys. I, you know, I'm, as you know, uh, Khaled is a personal friend, and so is Yosef Haddad. And I think they, in different ways, they do a very good job. And they, and I've seen also in the foreign ministry in the last few years more and more uh, Arab speaking Arab uh, from Arab community ambassadors, if Drew, not just Druze, but uh, Christian Arabs and. So George Deke, is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. No, and again, a no. wonderful envoy. I definitely think that we have to push out those voices. And I definitely think that we also haven't done enough with pushing out um, the Sephardi voices, the voices of people like me uh, from Arab, La you know, people that my mother's from Morocco, as you know, my husband's family, Iraqi. Um, there's not enough. I think that I've always said this, that the Sephardi uh, community or Mizrahi community in Israel um, are a natural bridge to the Arab world that the Ashkenazi, by large part Ashkenazi leadership, hasn't really utilized enough. But look at look at what's going on in Morocco now. You've had Mir, uh, Miri Regev and um, Amir Ohana, both um, transport minister and the and the speaker of the house, both from Moroccan backgrounds, going to Morocco in the last couple of weeks. I was there when Miri Regev was there for a conference, and um, I think it's wonderful. I really do. 
I think that we need to be doing more of that cultural bridge, cultural connection. They get it. The Moroccans, for example, are very proud of their Jewish heritage in the country. And I think we need to be doing a lot more of that with the rest of the Arab world. Very much so. And also, I don't want to, I want to remember the Druze. I mean, we have, you know, Absolutely. wonderful Druze citizens of Israel. I just want to mention. They're more Zionists than many of the, of the Jewish Israelis I know. Israelis, they, they, you know, they sacrifice have, their lives for it. They have a higher um, combat unit recruitment than Jews. Yeah. Do you know, there? I, uh, a 30 second story. I remember inviting one of the ambassadors of one of the Gulf countries to the Israel Tennis and Education Center, where I volunteer uh, for many, many years. And a wonderful Druze uh, Israeli manager there named Alam Ibrahim, who welcomed, he was our envoy uh, to one of the Gulf uh, ambassadors. And everything was in Arabic. The children came from, you know, tennis diplomacy, from, from the, the, the programs uh, in Taibe, waving Israeli flags and waving flags of the Gulf country. And the ambassador turned around and said, where am I? What is what is going on here? I mean, here is, you know, the state of Israel in the Arab cultural context. And in this case, it was sports. But it really it really proved to me um, the importance of cultural of acculturation uh, for Israel. 100 percent. And, and, and those things do take time. We can't expect that overnight people who've essentially been, uh, you know, educated in a certain way to see Jews in a certain way. Um, to think of Israel in a certain way, to all of a sudden just be okay with it. It, it. It's going to take some time. But from my perspective, I can tell you, in my women's forum, I think the women's forum is a really good kind of pulse to what's going on in the Arab world because women, you know, people think that these societies are very paternalistic. They don't understand how maternalistic they actually are. In the Gulf, I, I always say these, these men are, are all led and guided by their mothers. It's incredible. I, I, It was an understanding I didn't have until I got there. They're all mommy's boys like the Jews. Um, and so... That's another similarity. Oh my God. No, no. It, it really is incredible. It may be a patriarchal society on the outside, but in the inside, the mother rules the show. Um, and that's why my, my, my women's forum is so important. I've got women in my women's forum from Egypt who say to me, why did we never have any of this? So there's an element also that I'm finding of FOMO between the, you know, like from, especially from Egypt, less Jordan. Um, why didn't we ever do this? Why isn't, why did the acculturation never come here? And I think that's really interesting. And we see the numbers in trade. We've tripled the number in trade with Egypt since the Abraham Accords, doubled with Jordan since the Abraham Accords. Yeah. Sort of coincidence. Yeah. I mean, we now have a direct flight, more direct flights to Egypt than ever. Not a coincidence. This has all happened since the Abraham Accords. So this does take time. It's not an overnight game. And we should not be frustrated. And we should be patient. And also remember that every year, unfortunately, we have a war with Gaza. Yeah, the, the, this is the, the this is really the trigger. That's a bump in the road. It always is, but it's not the end. You know, I always use the metaphor when we were when we were when we first made uh peace normalization with the UAE, I always said that it, it felt like we were dating. Because they were so excited, all my friends there were so curious and excited about Judaism and Israel, and they'd ask me so many questions, and we'd find the common cultural points, and we'd find the common religious points, and it was. I, I, so I said in a, in a publication that I felt that we were dating, and then when the war of twenty twenty one happened, uh, you know, where the media was so rough with us in a war, of course, that we never started. Something curated, uh, troubles curated on Temple Mount in order to give the justification to the Muslim world and all that. And I said, you know, you don't break up after your first fight. Um, it makes you stronger. And I do feel that that, that bump on the road in, in 21 kind of set us up for the fact that this is not going to be plain sailing. We are going to have our little bumps on the road. Um, we had a Zoom. I remember the media was so, you know, they, 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 they knew they couldn't count on the media completely. And so I was asked to do a Zoom and explain what was going on. And I said to all my Emirati friends, um, and there were some Saudis amongst them, you know, think tank people and so on. And I said, you can ask me anything you want. I'll answer as honestly as possible. Ask me anything you want. And then we have to have this, these open, honest channels of communication. We have to be very clear uh, as we, in the last few minutes of our, of our chat here, uh, to, certainly to our Saudi friends and our, and our Gulf friends, that the Islamic Republic of Iran is playing a very bloody game of chess with us and with them. And their own the, people. The UAE is taking uh, rockets 
and yeah. drones yeah. Uh, in their own airport from the Iranian regime back Houthis, we're taking rockets and incendiary devices and tunnel terrorism from the other Iranian regime proxy called Hamas and from the south and Hezbollah from the north. So we're all facing the same exactly. Iranian regime crescent proxy war. And we have to keep reminding our friends that we are all on the same side of that war. I think at the high levels, they know that. Um, and um, listen, we can't forget the Russia, the Russia uh, angle here as well. I think the whole world is now understanding of what the axis of evil actually is. Yes, that's right. There is an axis of evil. And in fact, you know, what we have in this particular chat from Jeddah to Jerusalem, we actually have the axis of the good, the axis of the possible, the axis of... Exactly. Of the, of the, of, look, I always say if we actually had peace in this region, including uh, with the Palestinians, we, this region, could be the next global superpower. We have all those ingredients we just need to understand that as a region, we could really go somewhere. We can. And I think the Jeddah to Jerusalem uh, causeway, if you will, yes. in not only in the geopolitical imagination, but actually on the ground, is an important pathway to progress, success, prosperity, stability, and security for all of us. Can I thank you? And let me give you the last, the last thought, because you always have a good last thought. Oh, <laughs> well, look, I completely agree. I think that... We are looking at a new world of regionalism. And we see it everywhere. We see it all around the globe. And for us not to push that forward in order to have a better future for our children, inshallah, Bezrat Hashem, this is the moment. This is the opportunity. Well said. And uh, I think it's all been said. So, Fleur Hassan Nahum, thank you very much, Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem. Your insights on Israel, on the region. Uh, are uh, very helpful to all of us. And uh, thank you very much for joining us on our Middle East, the Middle East for all of us, Jews, Arabs, and everyone else in this uh, very complex, colorful, and region, uh, region of possibilities. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you.